on top of Celestia. So some of you guys have joined the workshop yesterday with Yas about project ideation. If you not have seen it, then feel free to watch it on the YouTube. And today we're very happy to have Nick White from Celestia to do a workshop, which is about the introduction to modular blockchains. So without further ado, let's welcome Nick from Celestia to start. And for the audience, if you do have any questions in the meanwhile, feel free to drop them in the YouTube um, comments or in the Binance Live chat room. So whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Awesome. Hey, guys, what's up? Um, I'm Nick White. I'm the COO at Celestia Labs. And um, it's my pleasure today to do an introduction to modular blockchain. So, um, you know, the goal of the presentation today is to give everyone uh, who may not be familiar uh, sort of the background of modular blockchains and then um, talk about some of the key concepts and, and then maybe talk a little bit about <clears throat> where the, the modular blockchain space is going uh, in the next few years. So um, with that, let's get started. So the first sort of like part of this presentation, I want to talk about um, basically monolithic to modular. So like where did the idea of modular blockchains come from? And, and like what are the advantages over monolithic architectures? So uh, as with everything blockchain related, it starts in 2008 when Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. And um, what was so novel about what Satoshi proposed in, in the Bitcoin white paper was that um, he envisioned a system for the first time that could have rules without rulers. So you could uh, have a bunch of people agree on a set of rules and then <clears throat> they would be able to enforce those rules without requiring sort of like this power hierarchy. So like normally in some you know, a system of cooperation, uh, a group of people want to, want to work together, you're going to need to have a ruler. It could be like a king or it could be the president or, or some lawmakers or, or an army or military or something that it has to enforce the rules on everyone else. So you end up with this sort of like uneven ground and this, this hierarchy. And the problem with that, with those kind of systems is that ultimately, you know, you have to trust the rulers to, to uphold the, the rules faithfully. And um, essentially those, those kinds of systems of cooperation uh, just have, have inherent drawbacks of like centralization of, of power and corruption and things like that. And with what um, Satoshi proposed for the first time, you could have a set of rules and then those rules could be enforced by, by everyone kind of on equal footing, essentially. So you don't need to have, you know, central authority or power. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a very equitable approach to like cooperation. And, um, and that's what blockchains are. And that was, was really what was so novel about, about Bitcoin at its core. And <clears throat> the way that this works, um, like blockchain cooperation works, is that the people who are participating in the network uh, have to run a node. And what a node is, is it basically is a computer program that has a copy of the rules. And you, uh, as, as new blocks get added, as new events take place, in the in the blockchain system, everyone you know inspects those transactions, inspects those blocks, and makes sure that they're following the rules. If they don't follow the rules, then they reject those blocks, and those blocks essentially just like don't don't happen. They don't actually take place. So running a node is essentially what enables blockchains to have this very unique property of, of rules without rulers, um, and it, it, it's the the verification of blocks that enforces the integrity of the blockchain. Um, and that's what removes trust from the system. Now, the problem with that is that if uh, you have to verify every single transaction that happens on, on, on each chain, on, on the chain, then as the number of transactions increases, then the amount of work you have to do to run your node and to, to verify the chain um, as a participant in that system increases uh, proportionally. So, um, you know, it's fine when there's, you know, I don't know, a few hundred transactions, uh, but then if you're starting to do like thousands of transactions, you know, or millions, or you know, in the future, maybe billions of transactions uh, in, in each block, 
all of a sudden the amount of work you have to do to verify increases by you know, a factor of of a hundred, a thousand, you know, a million, right? So, uh, essentially, what happens is, uh, as you scale the block size and the, the the throughput of these systems, the um, the person who is trying to verify them has to have a bigger and bigger computer. They need more and more bandwidth. They need more and more resources. It becomes more and more expensive for them to to verify the the chain. And so, uh, again, like in a monolithic blockchain. To run a full node means you have to download every single transaction and you have to verify every transaction one by one. So uh, to illustrate my point, it's sort of like this, this is like a meme that someone made, which I really like. It's like when the transaction data is small, it's totally fine. I can run my node on my laptop and like I can make sure that the chain is authentic. No one's like stealing funds or doing fishy things. But then as the transaction uh, data you know increases, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, I actually I'm unable to you know run that on my the computer that I have, and now I'm you, you fall back basically um, into having to trust the people who are running nodes, the people who are you know running the the miners or the validators. You have to assume that they're going to be honest to you essentially. And so, fundamentally, um, and, and and this slide is basically about the fact that so because of that constraint, you end up in a monolithic architecture, you end up with a block size that is that is fixed, um, which it, it gets fixed to what is the uh, amount of computing resources that you assume that the participant in the system should have or can have. And then when you fix the block size, as the more and more people want to send transactions, right, there's a limited supply and there's more and more demand, the price, the fees of using the system go up and it makes it unusable. Um, and so you're stuck in, in, a, in a monolithic architecture. You have this trade-off between um, big blocks. You can increase the block size, right? And then you can keep the fees low uh, and have more throughput. But then you lose decentralization because fewer and fewer people are able to actually verify and participate on an even footing on the network. Or you keep the blocks small, and then you just accept the fact that you're going to have high fees um, but the, the, the good thing is that you have really high decentralization, right? So, um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, people have criticized them for, uh, you know, not scaling the block size, but that's because they, they have wanted to preserve the verifiability and the decentralization of their network, even if it comes at the cost of high fees. So like in the monolithic blockchain architecture, this is like the, the fundamental trade-off that you have to have to make. And this, you know, is, is why, for example, um, there's been several different forks of Bitcoin, but most notably Bitcoin Cash, where the, the fundamental, um, you know, argument between the, the two sides was in Bitcoin Cash, they wanted to dramatically expand the size of Bitcoin blocks. And then the Bitcoin uh, core folks, like, didn't want to increase the block size because they wanted to make it so that people can run nodes. Um, and that brings us to sort of like stage two in the evolution of, of blockchain architectures. And um, that that is the Ethereum white paper. So in 2013, when Vitalik published the Ethereum white paper, um, it was a, a massive step forward in that it uh, generalized <clears throat> what you could, the kinds of rules you could express in on a blockchain. So like with you know Bitcoin, uh, you could think of it sort of like a calculator where it had very simple rules, a very limited expressivity like you know it's you know it's kind of just about transferring assets there's scripting but it's, it's so limited that you there's not very much that you can sort of build on top of it in ethereum the the uh the goal from the beginning was actually in you know the rules that we're going to instantiate and embed into ethereum itself are going to be rules to that, that basically instantiate a computer and then people can write their own rules of, that they that they deploy on top as smart contracts so ethereum if bitcoin is a calculator then ethereum is sort of like a computer is like you know calculator you can only do a few different kinds of operations and a computer um it's it's fully generalized and, and expressive and you can build all different kinds of applications on top of it so this was a massive step forward because it really um blew the doors open of what's what it was possible to do on chain and but the the, the issue though was that um, on the Ethereum computer, the Ethereum computer basically ha you know, has a built-in operating system or like virtual machine, and that is the EVM. And 
the the issue there is that it's sort of like you know imagine you you were given a, a a new computer but it it only ran windows for example but you you know you wanted to write or run mac apps or linux applications you wouldn't be able to do that because the computer just you know you couldn't like uninstall windows and reinstall mac or linux uh you're you're basically locked into what the computer came with right and so that's kind of what um ethereum and the evm is it's sort of like yes it's a computer there's a lot of things you can do on it but ultimately there are certain design decisions that were made for you as a developer that limit and they constrain what you can do so um you know the 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 even though you have like these wings and and you uh can can in theory build all these things in practice there's still constraints placed on you um and so that brings us to the, the third stage of the evolution of um, blockchain, blockchain architectures, which is um, the advent of modular blockchain. So in 2019, Mustafa Al-Bassam, uh, who's the co-founder of Celestia, published the Lazy Ledger white paper. So Celestia, for those of you who don't know, Celestia was originally called Lazy Ledger. And in that paper, he described a, a totally new way of thinking about how blockchains work and can be built. And essentially, the key word is modular. So in his vision, he realized that if you go back to the first principles of blockchains, there's actually you know, uh, a handful of different functions that are happening under the hood. And when Satoshi and other folks first designed blockchains, they unconsciously coupled those functions together into one monolithic system. But you know, if you go back to first principles, there's no reason that those functions all need to be bundled and coupled together. And so you, what you could do is actually unbundle the stack and build separate layers, separate protocols that specialize in those functions. And then you layer those pieces back on top of each other and you still have the same uh, you know, functionality. You can still build the same applications but all of a sudden you solve a lot of the core problems that monolithic blockchains face. So first is um, scalability. So, you know, as we talked about, blockchains are all about verifiability. That's what makes them decentralized and, um, and secure uh, and, and, and uh, removes trust and like equalizes power. So in a monolithic system, to do that, you need to run a node, right? So in a monolithic system, as we mentioned, Running a full node means downloading all the data and verifying every single transaction. In a modular blockchain system, because of the advent of two key technologies, which we'll talk about more later, but data availability sampling and rollups, this it totally changes the uh, the scale, scaling properties of of running a node, such that um, instead of downloading all the data, you can download just a tiny sample of it, and instead of verifying every single transaction one by one you can just verify a single proof. And essentially you can have, uh, you can have essentially the same security of running a full node with a tiny, tiny fraction of the uh, computing cost and resources uh, and, and running a so-called light node. And um, this is huge because instead of, you know, in the previous example as a transaction data uh, increases the number of people or, or that are using the network, it goes up. Uh, you know, eventually people are no longer able to run nodes. In this modular paradigm, even as the transaction block size increases, people can still run nodes and verify the network uh, without needing to drastically scale up their, their computing resources to keep up with the network growth. So in a monolithic world where, you know, you're constrained to a sort of fixed block size based on how many resources the node operators are meant to have, in a modular world, um, and, that, and that fixed block size means that the fees increase. In a modular world, you don't have a fixed block size. You can uh, increase the block size because it doesn't actually end up pricing out. Like you don't need more node resources. So the, the block size can be flexible and scale to meet demand. Uh, and you still, you can scale it while still preserving that really, really important property of verifiability. And so the idea with modular blockchains is that even as blocks get bigger and bigger, the, or sorry, as there's more and more people trying to use the, the network, the fees can still stay relatively constant. 
Uh, and so modular blockchains subvert this trade-off of big blocks. Uh, you, can, you can have big blocks with low fees, but still maintain high decentralization. And then the second part of uh, the like modular blockchain paradigm that that uh, solves a big problem is that in modular blockchains, execution is separated from settlement and consensus and data availability. And what that means is that you, as a developer, are no longer locked into one sort of operating system, if you will. You can choose what, what kind of operating system you want to run your program on. So it gives you full control, basically, over the execution part of, of the stack and, and allows you to customize things and do things that you can't do when you're building a monolithic chain and those choices have been made for you. So in a modular blockchain like Celestia, there actually is no execution on Celestia though. The whole point is that you get to choose what execution you wanna run on top of it. So it could be you know, anything. It could be EVM, Move, Solana VM, uh, Wasm, you know, Cosmos SDK. It could be something totally custom. Um, and so it's totally up to you. So the, the, the freedom, you're no longer like caged or constrained at that part of the stack. You can just do whatever you want. And so it's sort of like, you know, you're no longer stuck with Windows. You can have Mac or Linux or, or whatever. Um, and so um, to extend this analogy, if Bitcoin is a calculator and Ethereum is a computer, then you can think of Celestia and modular blockchains as cloud computers. So, um, you know, the 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 way to sort of like understand this is that in web 2 uh, the cloud stack at the, at the base of it right you have a data center and uh like aws right and what they specialize in is providing really scalable cost effective um compute like raw compute that developers can come to and uh basically pay to borrow or like sort of like consume that compute and they can run customized virtual machines, virtual servers on the data center that are you know, customized for the application that they wanna run. And they can scale it up or down. There's just, an, you know, it's very cost effective. And so it really, you know, the, the cloud stack has enabled the uh, like web two to, to, to really grow and scale has enabled developers and not have to worry about infrastructure, have all this flexibility um, like baked in uh, from, from the beginning. And so it's really unlocked like a ton of innovation. Now, if we shift to Web3 modular stack, it's a very similar uh, paradigm or, or design where instead of a data center, you have a data network like Celestia. So um, the data network like Celestia, what it does is it provides you with the raw resource of, of block space. So it's just like pure raw block space that you as a, as a blockchain developer can come to you and say, I'm gonna, I want this much of this block space and I'm going to, uh, I wanna run a virtual blockchain also known as a roll up or an L2 that is customized for the application that I wanna run. And you don't have to worry about infrastructure, it's taken care of for you and you have all the flexibility of being able to define the other layers of the stack. So it's a very similar paradigm. And so just like to, to sum up, you know, the benefits of building on something like Celestia are um, that you, you have this, this scalability where the block size is not fixed. It can scale with the number of, of light nodes and still preserve verifiability. Um, you also have uh, sort of like shared security between the different chains, um, which, which maybe we can talk about a little bit more in detail later. Um, but uh, basically rollups that share a common data availability layer have this privileged uh, ability to have what's called trust minimized bridging where they can do, uh, more or less run light nodes of each other. And that provides you with um, more secure bridging than, than um, the, the sort of bridges, standard like committee based bridging that we have today. And then last but not least is like the sovereignty and, and flexibility, flexibility that you get. So because you're not locked in uh, to a specific uh, you know, operating system, you get the, tr the, the, the ability to choose. And um, 
the other thing is like just to, to, to talk a little bit more about shared security, um, rather than having to, uh, you know, if you wanted to, let's say, so the other alternative to deploying a rollup is you, you want to have your own chain is to deploy a new monolithic L1, sort of like, you know, uh, sort of like uh, Cosmos, for example, you could you launch a new Tendermint chain. The problem is you have to bootstrap the security from, from zero. So you would have to issue a token, you would have to, um, you know, get a validator set. And then like the, the security of your chain is basically proportional to like, well, how, how what, like, what is the value at, at stake essentially? And then when you're a roll up and you build on something like Celestia, you actually plug into the security layer of Celestia. You don't have to bootstrap a new consensus network. You don't have to worry about, you know, how much stake you have because that you inherit from Celestia. Okay, so we covered monolithic to modular. So hopefully people kind of have some background there. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the key, key concepts. Um, so one of the first things that people like always get wrong about modular blockchains is that they think that data availability means data storage. And that is not the case. And it's, I totally get it because the, the, the name data availability sounds like storage right um and so it's really kind of like it's just you know you know we thought about trying to change the name um it was kind of like it's it's stuck it's a technical term um and uh but data availability is probably better thought of as data publishing so the the way to think about what data availability is is that it's like a i mean i i also use the sort of the uh, analogy of like a newspaper it's like you know the newspaper is all about distributing information. It's all about distributing the most valuable time sensitive information for everyone to see and, and, and read about and, and understand and know, right? And data availability is very similar. It's about, okay, here's all the most important things that have happened on chain. And we need to get this to as many nodes as possible so that they can see and, 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 and see, see all these transactions and get this information. So that's what, data availability is about. It's about publishing and making sure that the data behind the events, the transactions that are supposedly happening on these rollups and happening on chain is known publicly to everyone in the network. That's what data availability is about. And data storage is something that's very different. Data storage is more like a library. It's like, okay, there's some data. It's actually not time sensitive or like critical to the security of, of the chain necessarily. We just want to make sure that it's stored somewhere so that if we need it in the future, we can get it. But, you know, a library is not actually like taking the that, let's say it's a book, right? And then like distributing it to a bunch of people. It's just taking the book and then, you know, putting it down into, in some, you know, file storage system and, and plugging it in. And, and so that like, oh, when someone comes later and says, I want that book, they can they can pull it from the shelf, right? Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very different thing. Um, so, um, I just hope that people don't make this mistake because this is a question that, um, we get all the time, which is like, well, why can't you just use, you know, Filecoin or, uh, some other data storage, uh, network, uh, to do what Celestia does. And that's just because like, they're totally different orthogonal, like storage and data availability are just orthogonal things. Um, and then they require completely different protocol designs. So um, now let's talk about data value sampling. So a very core concept of like what powers Celestia, like what is the secret sauce that enables Celestia to, to do what it does? Well, that is this concept of data availability sampling. So what data availability sampling is, is this, um, you know, if you, so now the, the, the goal of a data availability layer like Celestia is that, okay, we want it, like normally, right, to solve, to make sure that data has been published, you would have to just download all that data yourself, right? That's the only way to know is the data there, you'd have to download it, uh, all of it. And um, of course, as we kind of discussed, like that does not scale as a solution because now as the amount of transaction data increases, I have to download more and more data, I need more and more bandwidth, and eventually I just don't have enough bandwidth to, to actually you know, keep up with the chain. I need to be in some like massive data center with like a gigabit connection or something, right? To verify the chain. So the goal of a data availability like layer like Celestia is to 
find a way to enable people to verify that the data is available, that it's been published without having to download all of it themselves. And this on the surface sounds like kind of impossible, but there was a very clever technique that Mustafa uh, came up with in collaboration with Vitalik and this other guy, Alberto Sonino in 2018. It's a really great paper um, where they designed this new system called data availability sampling that has that enables you to verify the data has been published with a very, very high statistical guarantee without having to download all the data. And, um, and we'll talk about that more in a, in a little bit, but the, the point of that is that now all of a sudden you, you break that, that trade-off, right? You can now have big blocks, you know, gigabytes of data per block, let's say, and you just have to download a few kilobytes or, you know, I don't know, maybe tens of kilobytes basically to verify that all that data is published. So let's talk about that uh, a little bit more. And so one of the core technologies behind data availability sampling is um, uh, the same thing that we use in CD-ROMs and QR codes is called erasure coding. And it, basically what erasure coding is, is it adds redundancy to uh, a file, like a data file. So if you have your, like your, your CD, right, encoding an MP3 file. Now the problem is if the CD got scratched, right, then all of a sudden you wouldn't be able to recover the file. You'd be missing parts of it. Um, so what they do, and obviously it's going to get scratched, or maybe the copying of that data is not actually perfect, right? So what do they do? They add redundancy. So if the, the original file was like, you know, one megabyte, they're going to add extra data to the end of the file, such that if you lose any part of it, any smaller part of it, you can still recover the original file. And so all of a sudden you have the, it's like, it's like a self healing data file, if you will. Right. And the same thing uh, is, is using QR codes. Like you can try for yourself and scan these two different QR codes, even though one is missing, you know, a large chunk, you, it still works. And the reason like you can cover up different chunks of a QR code and it still works because it has this redundancy baked in. Um, so, um, Basically, like the, the way that data availability sampling works under the hood is that, maybe I'll go back to this slide. You can imagine that if you have the original block data and you extend it using erasure coding, you make it bigger. Now, if, if someone wanted to hide even a small part, like make sure that no one could know the data that was in this portion of the block, they would have to make sure that they've, because, it, because the, the data would self heal, if they just hid that part, the remaining extra data is going to be enough to heal and recover what was what was trying to be hidden. So now all of a sudden, if you want to hide any part of the block, you need to hide a really large portion of it. So let's say we 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 doubled the we extended the block by two. You need to hide fifty percent of the overall block to hide any of it, right? So all of a sudden you have this property of like, okay, now you have to if you're trying to hide data, it needs to be a large amount. Now what you layer on top of that is a sampling scheme where you choose randomly, random chunks of that block to, to sample and say, hey, you block producer, give me that data. And let me make sure that it's there. And every time the uh, block producer is able to basically respond with uh, like the, a proper sample, then you become more and more confident that the block data is actually all available. So it's kind of like flipping a coin where, you know, if, you, if it keeps coming up heads over and over again, you become more and more confident that it's always going to come up heads, right? So uh, it, it's similar. Like the more you sample, you gain more and more confidence up until the point where eventually, after enough samples, um, you have a ninety nine point nine 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 percent confidence that the whole data is available. So it's like it's like a probabilistic way of verifying data availability. And um, yeah, this is the paper. I encourage everyone to um, to read it. And um, yeah, again, like the, the, the core concept here is that now instead of running a full node, we have to download the full block. You can run a light node, which just downloads a very small portion of it. And you, uh, you get the same security, essentially. Um, and so the, uh, you can run even like a light node on, on a phone, which, which we do actually have a phone, uh, Android phone on which I, I run a light node. So it's really, really light. Uh, let's see. And again, like 
the, the another core concept of data availability sampling, the way that it works is that the you in order for the scheme to be secure, right? You need to have enough uh, samples. You need you need it enough. You need enough samples to be taken among all the light nodes that they can perform the self healing operation of the block data. If you don't have enough people sampling, then it's possible for them to for the for the block producer to basically like um, trick a bunch of light nodes of the days available when it's not. Um, so you need to have a minimum number of light nodes such that they're going to sample enough of the block data that they can recover the original block. And so that's why um, you have this property where as long as there's enough light nodes in the network, you can securely increase the block size um, without losing the, the, the verifiability property. And um, again, like um, a light node is very different to a light client. So people may be familiar with a light client from other chains. Um, so a light client is basically um, tries to, it, 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 it's, it's a similar thing. It's like, okay, well, let's say you don't have enough resources to run a full node. You want to run something that at least gives you some level of security to verify the chain. And essentially what a light client does is it's, it just looks at the block header and says like, you know, does this have enough mining weight behind it in the context of Bitcoin or, and like, uh, you know, there's like uh, the consensus rules basically being followed. And, um, or in a proof of stake thing is like, oh, enough of the validators sign off on this block header. And if they did, it just says, okay, I'm gonna trust, I'm not gonna actually look inside and inspect that they, you know, follow the rules in, in these blocks. I'm just gonna assume that the validators were, were, were honest. And so, you know, you can verify things this way. And this is actually also how, uh, by the way, uh, you know, committee-based bridges work, like for example, IBC, um, they run a light client of another chain in their chain. And the problem is that then you're trusting the majority of validators in the other network, to be honest, and they could, um, they could just lie to you, right? They could actually say, they conclude and be like, you know what, actually we're gonna break all the rules and mint a billion dollars to ourselves. And uh, you know, the other chain's not gonna know about it or this user is not gonna know about it. And a light node is something where uh, you don't actually have to make that trust assumption. Um, you are, are actually verifying the chain um, uh, more or less directly. Uh, it's not the same security as a, as a full node, but it's, it's uh, essentially the same. And so you don't, you're, you're not just like checking the header of the chain, you're also sampling the, uh, the, 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 the data behind it to make sure it's available. You're also verifying the, the fraud or ZK proofs of the, the roll-up execution layer that you are uh, that you care about. And so light clients, that's why like the, 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 the phrase light node originated from this idea of like, uh, it's like a, a portmanteau of, of like full node and light client. So it's like, it's like a, the resources of a light client with the security of a full node. So it's a light node. Um, and then another concept to think about in the modular stack is you have different flavors of roll-ups depending on sort of how you mix and match the different components, right? So um, uh, maybe, you know, the standard rollup essentially has at the bottom like a consensus and DA layer like Celestia or Ethereum. It may have a different settlement layer or that could be, you know, in the case of Ethereum, it might be Ethereum itself. And then you have this sort of execution layer on top. There's a bunch of different ways you can build rollups. Um, and that's part of what's so exciting about modular blockchains is like mixing and matching of different components. So for example, Celestium, so mo what's most popular right now is that Celestia is being used as a uh, external data availability layer to Ethereum L2s, which is sort of what this like Celestium column represents, which is that um, you're running the, your roll up, it's posting data to Celestia, but it's settling uh, to Ethereum. And, and then you also have these things called sovereign roll ups, which are like, a, they do their own settlement essentially. So rather than, um, you know, uh, having their fork choice rule be embedded on a contract on another chain like Ethereum, they do their fork choice rule natively on the, the nodes. Um, okay, so hopefully that, I, that uh, covers like the key concepts of modular blockchains. I think, you know, th there's probably more that we could have talked about with, with rollups um, specifically and how they work. Um, but essentially just to cover that really quickly, the way that a rollup works is essentially 
you uh, you have some kind of proof system that makes it so that rather than having to verify every transaction that happens and make sure that each transaction follows execution rules, you just you have someone either uh, you you either trust uh, that if if someone tried to publish uh, an incorrect state transition like a like tried to break the rules that um, someone will generate a fraud proof and you'll be able to verify it on your little light node. Um, or you uh, have someone ZK prove um, that execution such that you know that it's, uh, you know that it's correct. Um, so the, the, the advantage of that is basically all of a sudden you don't have to re-execute every transaction if you want to verify that rollup. Um, okay, so now let's transition a little bit to be more forward looking. I want to talk a little bit about the path to a million rollups. So you may have like seen people on Twitter, um, like myself or David Hoffman or other people talking about this idea of like a world of a million rollups. And, um, you know, you might be wondering to yourself, well, like why, like that sounds kind of outlandish, right? Like uh, right now there's maybe 50 rollups on L2B. Um, you know, why a million just sounds like, absurd right um and and why also should we want that aren't rollups don't rollups just lead to fragmentation don't they have all these bad trade-offs um and so like you know a million rollups just sounds like this like chaos world where you know like nothing's actually going to work well um i'm going to talk a little bit about why i think a million rollups uh, getting to a million rollups is, is really valuable and then i'm going to talk a little bit about sort of each layer of the stack it's not going to be uh, um, it's not going to be sort of exhaustive because there's just too many things like too many, like the, the modular uh, sort of like stack is really growing and, um, and there's just so many different things happening that I can't cover everything in, in this presentation, but um, this will give you like a high level overview of like where we are at each layer of the stack on the path to a million rollups. Okay. So first, why, why would we want a million rollups to begin with? Well, if you think about, if you go back in time, and you think about the early internet, right? Um, it was uh, extremely small scale compared to today. It was like you know, you know, a few hundred servers, um, and you know, I don't know, a few thousand or maybe a million users or whatever in the early days, right? But that was so tiny compared to where the internet uh, has grown to today, where there are, uh, I think, over two hundred million active websites and, and applications. And there's literally billions of users around the world, and um, and I think uh, you know I think Web three is on a similar growth trajectory, right? Where we're still so early, there's like you know very you know, in the, you know few million users or tens of millions of users. Um, we have you know a few hundred chains, um, but where we're going to is this really rich, like uh, diverse world with way more applications and chains and users. And I think that this is um, like a, kind of a prerequisite to achieving the true promise of, of Web3 is we need to, you know, part of like, you know, why the web has been able to be successful is like, there's just so much experimentation, right? And uh, I think cloud, as I mentioned, had a big uh, part of this where like the, the, the more you like in order for the web to get to where it is today, right? There needed to be very scalable and flexible infrastructure for developers to build on scalable because like, okay, well, you know, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to get a billion users and hundreds of millions of, of websites? If there's not some kind of like a, a solid infrastructure that can actually support that amount of activity and usage. Um, and then second flexible, because if, you know, we want to, uh, the way that the web, web two kind of unlocked all these like killer use cases is that they, by lowering the cost of innovation and experimentation, people were able to just like, you know, build stuff and ship it and iterate and like experiment at, at a low cost. And so that's, you know, why we have all the, the amazing applications that we use every day is because uh, it was very, it became very easy to experiment. Thanks. Thanks to the cloud. Um, and so I think modular blockchains uh, have a similar goal of like, A, they want to be extremely scalable for all the, you know, all the technology, the, the technical innova innovations I mentioned. Um, and then second of all, they want to really make it uh, easy and flexible to experiment, right? So you can 
now like go into the execution layer and try new things that have never been tried before. And, and by having all this flexibility, we're going to be able to um, find the killer use cases, right? It's not like, you know, if we knew what they were a priori, then they would already be built. But the thing is like, when you have something as fundamentally paradigm shifting as, as blockchains, right? Um, it's not going to be clear what the, what, what the killer use cases are going to be. We have to kind of discover them. Um, so anyway, uh, where are we sort of like on the evolution of modular blockchains? Well, and, and on the path to a million rollups. Well, um, Celestia, you know, after being, you know, the, the, the white paper being published in 2019, uh, launched in 2023. Um, and this is really like a landmark launch in the, in the sense that it's the first time that data availability sampling has actually been implemented and is working on a live network. And, you know, this is very similar to me to sort of like the, the advent of, of broadband, I guess, for, for the internet, where it, it, you know, the equivalent is that it's just increased the capacity uh, and, and the bandwidth of, of decentralized systems um, because it's like a step function change in, in the scalability properties of, of, of like block space. So you also think of it as sort of like this, this big bang uh, for, the, for the modular ecosystem where uh, now that we've kind of removed that constraint, at least of, of block space, all of a sudden it's, it's like, we now have the ability to experiment and build on top of something new. We were kind of constrained, like, you know, there were a lot of rollups on Ethereum, but they were, they were really constrained by the throughput of Ethereum. And so, um, and, and Celestia is sort of like leading this charge of like, this is a new wave of expansion and growth in a new category of blockchains called modular blockchains. And <clears throat> following Celestia's launch, a bunch of uh, different Ethereum L2s, um, basically migrated to using Celestia for DA. And um, the, the amazing thing is that, that that it resulted in millions of dollars in cost savings uh, across all these different rollups and started to sort of, sort of prove out this, um, this new reality that we're in where all of a sudden you can run an application uh, that, uh, that has like price points. You know, you can spin up basically your own blockchain extremely easily and it can have uh, really really low costs for users and um, so it's like it's it's really opening the doors of, of what's possible and I think you know this is really just the the first step and kind of just like proving out that this 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 system works and um, now like sort of we're, we're entering into another phase where we're starting to have more meaningful uh, integrations and deployments such as uh, Blobstream, which has been deployed now on base as well as on Arbitrum. And essentially what this unlocks is the ability for people to deploy L3. So rather than only just settling to Ethereum with Celestia underneath, now you can settle to base or uh, Arbitrum, or frankly, maybe in the future, even Bitcoin or um, you know, insert other uh, ecosystem or settlement layer uh, into that mix. Um, and what's so exciting about that is that like you can think of Celestia as sort of this um, it's very pluggable modular data availability layer that can help any other ecosystem scale um, because like you once you reach your you know throughput constraints or capacity uh, on that chain you can start to offload some of that throughput capacity to Celestia and to layer twos or layer threes that are building on top of Celestia so that is sort of like this. One, one, one of the goals, right? And um, I mean, beyond this, I didn't have time to add this to the slides, but Sessi is also integrating, you know, currently all those stack, the, the, the rollups that I uh, showed above were all OP stack rollups, but we just recently announced the uh, integration with Arbitrum uh, Orbit and uh, the support for nit Nitro fraud proof. So now we're actually having some of the first, uh, you know, fraud provable data value sampling rollups coming to market. And um, I just think it's it's an incredibly exciting time to be part of this like modular blockchain movement because like you know every every month there's there's like an, an insane amount of progress. And so by the way, like I know I just talked a, a lot about Celestia specifically, but if you zoom out, this is a much bigger um, ecosystem than just Celestia, um, and there's a bunch of different components and parts of the stack, and really. Um, something I want to drive home is that the modular blockchain 
movement is something that is so ambitious and big that there's no way any one team can build it. And in general, like the, 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 the goal of building blockchains uh, and Web3 is so big that it, it was never, there's never going to a monolithic, you know, single chain, you know, one core dev team, you know, is never going to be able to actually build it out. You're going to need, it's going to need to be a, like a, a collaborative effort among tons of different teams and developers. And um, what's so cool about the modular stack is that you can now kind of identify a specific problem uh, in the infrastructure that you want to tackle. And you can just go and try to solve that problem. You can have your own opinion about what's the right solution there, right? And the other thing is that there's, there is no right solution, right? It's all subjective. And that's why we say things like build whatever is because we, we believe that people should have the ability, that developers should have the ability to choose from the best uh, solution for them, right? There's no one size fits all. It's about, you know, what, like what fits you the best. Um, so I, I, I think like, it's really important basically to drive home that, that there's a huge amount of teams building on building different things. And uh, this list is growing every day. Um, okay. So, so I have like 10 more minutes. I'm going to try to get through all the rest of this stuff. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about specifically what's happening at each layer of the stack here. And again, this is not exhaustive. This is just like the four main layers that people talk about, but there's lots of different components that are not covered. Um, and I'm also kind of like taking a little bit of creative freedom to sort of in interpret some of these layers a little bit. So the first one is data availability, right? Um, data availability is essentially, you know, as we, we talked about, it, it kind of is the, the core scaling, one of the core scaling bottlenecks of these systems. You need like, it's where the block space comes from that you run all these chains on. And data availability is very uh, um, important. It's critical to the security of, 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 um, of your chain. And so what we want from a data availability, from the data availability layer to get to a million rollups is it needs to have way like so much throughput, like gigabytes of throughput. Um, and the like gigabyte, I don't know, gigabytes per second. I should actually do some back in the napkin calculations. Um, but we need a lot, basically. And we want it to still be verifiable and secure because it's really the base, the foundation. And so where we are today is that Celestia launched recently, EAP 444 launched, and uh, that increases the, the throughput capacity of the DA layer quite a bit, but still, you know, orders of magnitude away from where we need to be for this, this future of a million rollups. Uh, the nice thing is that because there's data availability sampling, um, it's more about scaling. I mean, there's a lot of different scaling bottlenecks to come through to, to overcome, but um, the nice thing is that data availability sampling is working in practice. And that means that we can now start to scale block, block space production more aggressively than we could before. Um, what's also really nice is we have projects like Avail, Eigen DA and Near coming on, which are also going to inc increase uh, throughput of the DA layer. Um, uh, but one of the other things, aside from not having enough throughput, is we also need to start uh, rolling out more light node adoption. So, for example, one of the things Celestia is doing is um, we are uh, working on um, Rust clients to be able to uh, embed um, light nodes in browsers and in, in uh, mobile apps. So uh, I think that's really exciting because that's how we can actually have it so that users are running light nodes by default and we end up scaling the amount of light nodes. All right, the consensus layer, this is where ordering of transactions happens, right? So um, consensus is all about like ordering data, ordering transactions. And this is an important thing because this is where, you know, people, you know, transactions either get excluded or excluded. So there's censorship resistance. There's also like liveness, you know, if, if the consensus layer goes down, same with the data availability layer, frank, frankly, like you don't really, you're not able to finalize more blocks. And the other thing that's really important about consensus layers, this is where MEV lives. Um, because, if, you know, or MEV is all about manipulating the ordering of transactions to extract value. Um, so where are we with consensus? Like you can use Ethereum and Celestia as your consensus layer as well as, a, as, well as DA layers. Um, but, uh, you know, most rollups have a centralized sequencer kind of running on top of that. And uh, the reality is that's just not, uh, that great because that sequencer can censor you or um, it could go down and the, the whole rollup can halt or also it, it, there's no MEV mitigation in most of these rollups and sequencing schemes. So like that 
sequencer just either it captures the MEV itself or you know you end up with these like uh, if you don't you don't have like the right tooling you end up with really bad UX because people are spamming the sequencer trying to like front run or back run and things like that. So um, there's a lot to be uh, still desired at the sequencing there. I will say that fortunately a lot of these centralized sequencers do have like inboxes or exit schemes where you know even if the sequencer acts maliciously there's ways for you to get out um, without you know too much downside to, 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 to users um, but what's coming this is exciting is we have shared sequencers like astria and espresso and nokid and, and radius and i'm sure there are more and madara and um and also op stack is working on things like the the super chain um, we also have Sovereign Labs, which is working on um, base sequencing, so you can actually sequence directly on the like Ethereum or, or Celestia. Um, but the cool thing about shared sequencers is that they're initially basically like decentralized sequencing as a service. And uh, some of these teams, like um, uh, at least Astria, I know, and, or, and also Radius, are building in the M like different MEV like tooling. So Radius has like um, things like uh, threshold encryption. Uh, for their mempool, and then Astria has things like sort of like MEV Boost or like Flash Boss esque kind of MEV tooling. Um, so the, and these a lot of these are are like quite close to launch, and so this is going to really level up the sequencing game for the ecosystem. Next is settlement, and so settlement is basically where um, you know I, I'm 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 kind of using the word settlement to mean bridging in this context. So it's it's basically like well when you have all these different rollups they're gonna need to be able to connect with each other and interoperate with each other. Otherwise they're just islands isolated from each other. And then you don't like the functionality is isolated and, and so much smaller. Uh, we don't wanna have this fragment. It's like basically overcoming fragmentation is the way to think about the settlement layer. And we're definitely gonna need that if we're in a world of a million rollups. So where we are is like, we have a lot of um, cool bridge. I think there's a lot of cool committee based bridging um, solutions. Um, and, oh, and also I didn't mention this idea of chain abstraction, but basically, you know, if there's a million rollups, you can't expect a user to manage a million different wallets across all those different rollups, right? Or accounts you're going to need, and you also don't want them to have to like send, if they're trying to do something cross chain, you don't want them to have to like sit there, wait for the first transaction, then go to the next chain, do the next thing and so on and so forth. You're going to want it to be able to just like them to send one thing, have it all happen behind the scenes and get done. And so that's what chain abstraction is all about, is making it so that to the user, they don't have to think about the complexity that's happening at the roll-up layer. It all kind of like looks and behaves like one unified system to them. So the, re the reality is like bridging actually does work in the modular stack. It's actually not as bad as people think. Um, if you try things like Hyperlane or even um, there's another one called Relay and you know we have a cross and whatever, um, but the reality is a lot of them are still not very secure because the proof systems are not, like the bridges are all committee based essentially. And like the problem with a committee, when your committee is a roll up sequencer or like a multi-sig, it's just really not that secure. So we need to get to more proof based bridging. And frankly, the UX is still clunky. We have things like skip API, which make it slightly better, but we can use intense um, to make things better. Also one, something that's really exciting is a polygon aggregation layer. Uh, last is execution. I'm gonna just, running out of time, so I gotta kind of go through this. Execution is where all the smart contracts live. It's where, you know, developers build. Um, we, there's a huge amount of progress on the EVM side of, you know, supporting EVM execution layers and rollups. Um, there hasn't been enough uh, dedicated to alt VMs, or at least we don't have any, enough of them live. We have Cosmos SDK, but I'm really excited because Eclipse and Movement, Initia, Fluent, all these Argus, they're all basically shipping these new alt VMs like SVM, Move, Wasm, you know, World Engine, things like SP1. And I think like we're, the, the progress of ZK proofs has been very promising because I think we're getting close to this like breakout point essentially where um, we're going to have a lot of support for a lot more different VMs and they're going to be performant and secure because we're going to have real like pro proving systems. So anyway, all that was a ton of talk about infrastructure. And I just want to leave off by reminding people that, um, you know, Ultimately, modular blockchains, there's a like very common criticism, which is, oh, it's just infrastructure for infrastructure's sake, right? But the truth is that um, this is all, all this infrastructure that's being built is in the service of developers and users. Like the reason why Celestia was built 
and why all these other different modular components are being built is to serve developers so they can build new compelling applications and bring and onboard more users to Web3, right? And unlock all these use cases that we, we don't know of yet. And so, um, you know, that can often get lost and people are like, oh, well, whatever, you guys need to think more about users. It's like, here we are, that's, that's the whole point of this, right? So, um, and that's also why, you know, I, I wanna say that it's a really exciting time to be part of the modular stack as a developer, because right now, all these new components are being shipped and it's unlocking all these things that you couldn't do before on the monolithic stack. So if you're ambitious, you know, and you're willing to uh, experiment with this stuff, I think there's a lot of alpha, there's a lot of uh, things that you could unlock for the first time and build for the first time that no one's been able to build before. And like, that's why the motto of Celestia and, and, and the modular blockchains uh, more broadly is like, is, is, is like build whatever, right? It's about the fact that you can build whatever you want. And it's like this open canvas for you to explore. There's bit, way more block space throughput. There's uh, all these new different things you can customize and experiment with. So like all like the, the, the constraints you had before are, are blown, blown down. And of course, that's why we're doing the Infinite Space Bazaar is to attract and, and nurture the first sort of cohort of builders in the modular stack, which is you guys. Um, I'm really excited about uh, working with you all and seeing, seeing what you build. And I want to say that we're doing Modular Summit um, in July. Uh, this was already announced, but um, it's going to be a really exciting place to, to all converge and, and talk about the infrastructure, talk about the applications that are being built in the modular stack. And so I encourage people to, to come if they can. And again, remember the, the, the high-level vision here, right? We want to get to a world of, of a million roll-ups. And um, that's going to take both infrastructure as well as developers and people experimenting with the stack and, and a feedback loop, right? Of like, you know, learning from each other and, and, and together is how we sort of achieve this end vision. So uh, yeah, that, that's all I have. I'm on Twitter, obviously. Um, and then here's some resources. Uh, you're probably already aware of the Learn Modular page. It's a great place to learn modular concepts and then Build Modular, which is, you know, the developer portal. I'm sure you guys have already seen that. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for this great workshop. I hope the audience learned a lot more about modular blockchains, how it differentiates to monolithic blockchains, the benefits. So let's head over to the audience questions. We're a bit late in time, but there's like one question from the audience. In short, we can't make Perfect. use of Reddit. Uh, my SQL MongoDB for DA question mark. Yeah, so good question. So um, DA is not like uh, you know a database, right? It's like um, you. It needs to be decentralized. So you don't want to just, uh, for example, upload your block data to Amazon S3 and be like, oh, I'm done. The data is available because again, right? It's about data publishing. It's about the verifiability of the system. If we could just run Web3 on, you know, centralized storage like Amazon, then like it would already be scalable and uh, be trivial to like, you know, build whatever we want. The thing is that the, the core essence of what makes uh, Web3, Web3, what makes a blockchain a blockchain is that you can verify things, right? That's what, that's where this notion of rules without rulers comes from, is the fact that anyone on the internet with an internet connection can run a node and verify your thing, your application that you built and know there's no funny business. The things that he, you know, what, what he says he's gonna do with my money and what the code says is actually gonna be upheld by the network. If you don't have that property, then it's like, oh, I'm not gonna deposit my dollars into your decks. Like you could do it like, you know, if it was running on a S3, you could just like literally walk away with it, right? So, um, uh, you you know, uh, so so basically, yes, you, you need to have like a decentralized system like Celestia to do that. And um, the way to, that you, maybe you're asking specifically about like, how do you, you know, um, like, I guess, uh, like put data onto Celestia and how do you get it back? Um, because it's a decentralized network, it's not SQL. It's like you use our, our node API. Like you have to basically send a transaction, which is a pay for blob transaction, which defines what's the data you want to put on it. Then when that data has been like included in a block, there's ways for you to basically get a proof that the data is there um, and, and show that proof to other people. 
So that's, that's kind of what, so it's very different to like in the interface of the database, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a good response. Do you have any final remarks before we wrap up the session? No, I just hope that that was interesting and useful to folks. So um, yeah, I'm like, if you have any questions, ping me on Twitter um, and I'd love to, you know, share more uh, knowledge if I can be useful. Um, and um, I just want to see what you guys build. Like, I'm really excited. And so also if you have ideas that you want to float, like I'd love to hear them. So build whatever. So thanks a lot for the session. Thanks, Nick from Celestia for joining us today. There will be another workshop tomorrow at the same time. And also next week are a few other workshops. Um, so feel free to also subscribe to our YouTube and our Binance Live channel. If you not have joined the Celestia Discord yet, yet uh, please, free, please feel free to join the Discord. Yeah, there's a lot of support mentorships that you can get in order to build a cool product. So thanks a lot for joining us today and see you soon. Thanks, everyone.